at the Warner Robins Museum of Aviation in Georgia, you can see a wide variety of airplanes from World War II up until today's modern military jets. But this Air Force Museum also holds some important clues about a very special person who served in the 14th Air Force during World War II. His name is Captain John Burge, who served under General Claire Chenault as an intelligence officer. But John Burge did not come to China as a soldier. He came to China as a Baptist preacher and missionary who wanted to spread the gospel and start Bible-believing churches. This picture shows intelligence staff of radio liaison station Dog Sugar 8, located near Changsha. The Americans on the front row are John Birch from Macon, Georgia, on the left, and also Malcolm Rosholt from Rosholt, Wisconsin. Birch was killed in August 1945 by communists. Rosholt wrote two books on his experiences, Dog Sugar 8 and Day of the Ching Pao. Several books have also been written about the life and death of John Birch. John Morrison Birch was born in Landar, India on May 28, 1918, the son of missionaries. In 1934, his family moved to Macon, Georgia, where John attended Mercer University to study theology. After graduation, he was ordained a Baptist minister and went to China to continue his parents' missionary work. He was working in the Chekyang province in April 1942 when he helped Colonel James Doolittle and his men escape pursuing Japanese troops after their raid on Tokyo. After attempting to join the Army Air Forces as a chaplain, Birch became a member of General Chenault's intelligence staff and was instrumental in expanding and maintaining the early warning net in eastern China. He became a top field agent, establishing observation posts along the Chinese coast and directing airstrikes deep behind Japanese lines. Because of his knowledge of Chinese language, he was assigned as 14th Air Force liaison to Chinese Marshal Sui Yo, coordinating air support within the Chinese 9th War Area. A few days after Japanese surrender, Birch was sent to Suko to secure Japanese documents and to bring back any Allied POWs interned there. On the 25th of August, his party was stopped by a band of Chinese communists and in the resulting confrontation, Captain Birch was shot and killed. The Birch family still resided in Macon and graciously donated these artifacts. This was the time of the Flying Tigers. Let me give you the background. Much of the Flying Tiger's success was due to advanced fighter tactics designed by their godfather, Claire Chenault. He had a reputation as a precision flyer, brilliant tactician, and evangelist for pursuit warfare. After his retirement, Chenault became civilian advisor of air training in Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's Nationalist Chinese government, where he met the newly appointed National Secretary of Aviation, Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Madame Chiang, who attended Wesleyan College in Macon, Georgia, was impressed with Chenault and his southern friends from Maxwell Field, Alabama. Chenault was originally from Texas. For the next four years, Chenault tried to beef up the Chinese Air Force, collected a huge amount of intelligence on Japanese air tactics, and planned a counteroffensive. In mid-1941, he finally got some help for the desperate Chinese battling against massive Japanese air raids. President Roosevelt signed a secret executive order to allow American airmen to resign their commissions to fight for China. The American Volunteer Group was born. Chenault used his vast experience to teach Japanese tactics and aircraft to the pilots. After four months of intense training, the group entered combat in December 1941, shortly after Pearl Harbor. With the United States at war with Japan, the AVG continued to fight for the Chinese until July 1942, when the group was disbanded and the China Air Task Force was created. As the war intensified, many missionaries left China, but John Birch stayed in China and served in the military. 
While in the military, John even continued some of his mission work in preaching, witnessing, giving out gospel tracts to the local Chinese people that he befriended. What you see here are some of the military decorations he earned. This is a Purple Heart similar to the one awarded to Captain Birch in 1945. This is a Legion of Merit and Chinese Order of the Cloud awarded to John Birch. He was recruited and promoted to the rank of Captain by General Claire Chenault. This is a 35 millimeter camera used by Captain Birch while on a special mission for General Chenault, donated by the Birch family. A silk map carried by Captain John Birch while behind Japanese lines at intelligence station Dog Sugar 8, donated by the Birch family. This is a dress uniform worn by John Birch while serving in the 14th Air Force. But the one greatest artifact on display at the Air Force Museum at Warner Robins, Georgia is an essay that John Birch wrote shortly before his death. What were the hopes of a young American preacher, missionary, and soldier from Macon, Georgia, serving in China? What kind of life was he longing for when the war was over? What were the expectations? What kind of a walk with the Lord did John Birch have? John Birch wrote an essay entitled The War Weary Farmer. Here's what it says. I should like to find the existence of what my father called plain living and high thinking. I want some fields and hills woodlands and streams I can call my own. I want to spend my strength in making fields green and the cattle fat, so that I may give sustenance to my loved ones and aid to those neighbors who suffer misfortune. I do not want a life of monotonous paper shuffling or of trafficking with money-mad traders. I only want enough of science to enable fruitful husbandry of the land with simple tools, a time for leisure, and the guarding of my family's health. I do not care to be absorbed in the endless examining of force and space and matter which I believe can only slowly lead to God. I do not want a hectic hurrying from place to place on whizzing machines or busy streets. I do not want an elbowing through crowds of impatient strangers who have time neither to think their own thoughts nor to know real friendship. I want to live slowly, to relax with my family before a glowing fireplace, to welcome the visits of my neighbors, to worship God, to enjoy a book, to lie on a shaded grassy bank and watch the clouds sail across the blue. I want to love a wife who prefers rural peace to urban excitement, one who would rather climb a hilltop to watch a sunset with me than to take a taxi to any Broadway play. I want a woman who is not afraid of bearing children and who is able to rear them with a love for home and the soil and the fear of God. I want of government only protection against the violence and injustices of evil or selfish men. I want to reach the sunset of life sound in body and mind, flanked by strong sons and grandsons, enjoying the friendship and respect of neighbors surrounded by fertile fields and sleek cattle and retaining my boyhood faith in him who promised a life to come. Where can I find this world? Would its anachronism doom it to ridicule or loneliness? Is there yet a place for such simple ways in my own America? Or must I seek a vale in Turkestan where peaceful flocks still graze the quiet hills. I agree with John Birch. That really speaks to my heart. Where can I find this world? That's what I'm asking. We should consider that simple life that John was writing about. There better be a place for such simple ways in today's America and in today's world. That is our number one job. It is very sobering how John Birch, back in 1945, could see the errors of our modern society, of our post-Christian society. 
He knew it all back then. In his prophetic condemnation of our godless age these days. On a hill overlooking the city of Macon, Georgia, you get to Coleman Hill Park. There in that park sits a monument honoring those citizens of Macon, Georgia, who gave their lives in World War II, among them John Morrison Birch. In grateful appreciation of those of our own families and friends who gave their lives in World War II, that the ideals they cherished more than life might not perish from the earth. We, the citizens of Bibb County, have caused their names to be engraved upon this tablet and have surrounded it with rare magnolias, a living memorial to their unfaltering devotion.